Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to One to Fuca on Fire. It's a webinar and a community roundtable. We'll just wait one minute for all the participants to join, and then we'll start. All right, good afternoon. We'll start. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Reimer. I work at the Capital Regional District. I'm, I manage uh, fire and emergency programs here. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about wildfire in the Juan de Fuca. Uh, we're really happy that you're joining us. Uh, so uh, welcome. We have up to an hour and a half, but that really depends on you. This is going to be a two-way conversation uh, about wildfires in your region. I know there's a number of communities and we'll talk about how that works uh, shortly. Uh, one thing we did want to say beforehand is that this webinar is being recorded. So just be aware of that in the questions that you ask or how you present yourself. Uh, and we will be sharing the recording of that with you folks after. Uh, at any time today, so it can be right away or any time when people are talking or afterwards, you can ask a question to the presenter and we will be picking up those questions and making sure that we answer them at the end of each session. So each, each speaker will, will uh, speak to their questions and there's an opportunity at the end to, to ask any questions to the panel. So what do we have on the agenda today? We have four speakers. Uh, first off, we're gonna have Connor speaking to wildfire resiliency in Juan de Fuca. Uh, following him will be Rob speaking to how to protect homes during wildfire. Then we'll be speaking on evacuations from Jane. And last but certainly not least, Jerry uh, will tell us about the grab and go bags and how to prepare those pieces. So that's what we'll be talking about. Uh, we're gonna kick off today with a little bit of a poll so that we can understand where you're coming from us, where you're coming from today. So uh, right in front of you, you should have a list of different communities in the Juan de Fuca area. Uh, please select where you're from and submit it. Uh, and then I'll share the results of that poll with you folks. Uh, if you are not from the Wanda Fuca electoral area or you're in a nearby area or, or just not listed there, please feel free to, uh, to drop in other. All right, I'm gonna end the poll, share the results of that poll. So it looks like we have a few folks from Otter Point, uh, some folks from East Souk and Shirley and at least one from other. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, one last poll here. If I can figure out how to do it. Uh, in your judgment, what is your risk of wildfire? Where you are, where your home is, where you work, uh, where do you think you are in terms of your level of wildfire risk? So we have most of you have responded. I'm gonna share the results here. Uh, so you can see that most of you have, are thinking you are in the high area, a few moderates, uh, and then also somebody in low and somebody in extreme. So a range of answers there. And we'll be digging into those, um, those answers later today. So without further ado, uh, I am going to cede the floor to our first speaker. Uh, and uh, Connor, you have the floor. Thanks, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. My name's Connor. I'm just changing over to my slides here. Thanks for joining us at this webinar. Uh, I'm going to be discussing, to kind of set the stage, our recent work with Jonathan, creating a community wildfire resiliency plan for the Juan de Fuca electoral area. Because our time is a little bit brief and this is a bit of a big project, I'm just going to be limiting my, my remarks to just some highlights, specifically our wildfire risk analysis that was included as part of this PWRP, that's what we call them for short. 
Um, after my presentation, we'll have a chance for some questions. If there's questions that come to you later or I don't answer your question or you're not satisfied with the answer, I encourage you to follow up and we'll be able to put our heads together and hopefully come up with something that answers the question. So to start off, uh, what is a community wildfire resiliency plan? These are plans for local government. So in this case, the Capital Regional District, and it's really high level and it's supposed to be a bit of a foundation for building, it's sort of set the stage for mitigating wildfire risk. And it acts as a roadmap for local government to build community resiliency to wildfire. And the first step is to assess what the wildfire risk is. And that's gonna be the main focus of what I'm talking about today. And these plans are funded through a grant from the British Columbia provincial government. And that's important because that means that we have to make sure our plan, the plan meets those requirements. And that's something that'll become a little bit evident in some of the things that come up in this discussion. So this is the study area for our community welfare resiliency plan. In white is the Juan de Fuca electoral area. As you can see, it's very large. A vast majority of it is undeveloped forested land in the crown land, often the forest or big private forested land. Um, but what we're really focusing on is just a small subset or a smaller subset of land within Juan of Fuca that we call the wildland urban interface. And that's these areas that are highlighted in orange around the main communities. And this is the most important area to focus on for wildfire risk analysis. And that's, because, that's for three reasons. First, it's where most of the values are. And most of the things we wanna prevent from being involved in a wildfire are gonna be located in the wildland urban interface. Secondly, it's where built communities, or built homes interface with forest. So where they're most exposed to potential sources of wildfire. And third, it's where most of our human caused wildfires start. Most human ignitions occur where most of the humans are. And in this part of the world where we don't get that much lightning, that becomes particularly important because most of our wildfires are caused by human sources. So before we dive into our wildfire risk analysis for Juan de Fuca, it's first that we have to develop an understanding of wildfire risk. Because when we talk about wildfire risk, we actually have a really specific definition in this context. So risk in all senses is a matter of probability of an event and the consequences of that event. So anything from tsunamis to earthquakes, to volcanoes, to wildfire, it's when we're trying to assess risk in a quantitative way, we think about consequences and the probability of that event happening. And so in terms of probability, we call that wildfire threat. And really simply, this really simple way to understand that is how flammable an area of vegetation is, a particular area of vegetation. So that depends on what type of vegetation it is, what type of terrain there is, and what type of weather is normal in the area. And we designate areas as from very low to extreme wildfire threat. And it's really, the really simple way again is just how flammable those areas are, how susceptible they are to burning. And what we're doing in wildfire risk is we're taking that understanding of how flammable an area is and understanding where that area is in, in re relative to where the things we wanna protect from wildfire is. So how close is that to our values we're trying to protect? And risk really hinges on that because you can have a wildfire way off thousands of kilometers in the forest, that's really not that concerning, regardless of how vigorous the fire is and how extreme it is. And in contrast, you can have a very low intensity wildfire that's really close to a home or community, and that can be really high risk despite the low wildfire behavior. And so what we do when we're assessing wildfire risk is we combine how flammable the forest is and where those flammable forests are in relation to our community values. And that gives us wildfire risk ratings. And that's simply put, how likely is any area to have a severe wildfire during the normal weather conditions we see in that area? So what are under the most hottest and driest conditions that happen regularly, what type of fires can we expect close to our communities? 
So in an extreme wildfire risk area, that might be a forest right beside Kelowna in the Okanagan, places that are really susceptible to wildfire, really close to communities. In contrast, a low wildfire risk is gonna be areas that are not susceptible to wildfire and quite isolated. So we can think of really isolated parts of the coast where it's really wet and really far away from communities. And that's kind of sets the stage for our wildfire risk analysis in Juan de Fuca. So this is one of the first things that we do in our community welfare resiliency plan is assess that risk. And generally speaking, our wildfire risk, I'll show a zoomed in, a, a map that's zoomed in on the communities instead of the zoomed out one, but this just highlights two points. And the first is that one of the subject, one of the grant conditions for this project is that we don't assess wildfire risk on private land. And that's because we just lack reliable data for wildfire risk on private land. And the second is that the wildfire risk ratings in Juan de Fuca vary. It's generally around a moderate wildfire risk and it is lower in the West in the Port Renfrew area and it increases as you move east, sort of to the to the East Souk and the Malahat Willis Point areas. And here's just a zoomed in map. And as you can see, around Port Renfrew, we have a little bit of low wildfire risk mixed in with the moderate. And then as you look at Jordan River, as you move east, you start to see a little bit more of how high wildfire risk. And there's just a couple factors that really are important and somewhat unique to Juan de Fuca when it comes to wildfire risk. The first is that this area of BC is really, really dominated by coniferous forests. And coniferous forests, so Douglas fir, western red cedar, those tend to be a little bit more, or in some cases, quite a bit more flammable than deciduous forests like big leaf maple or red alder, cottonwood. However, the coniferous forests of the coast tend to be lower flammability than the other coniferous forests we see in British Columbia. And the second factor that really impacts wildfire risk is the climate. We live in a part of the world that's generally quite wet for most of the year. However, it does get very hot and dry for brief periods in the summer. And although it's a small window, wildfires are very much possible during these weather conditions. And so just to hammer home these two key findings is that wildfire risk is moderate throughout the Juan de Fuca. But what does that mean? What that means is that wildfires are possible. Pretty much every summer we do have conditions where wildfires are possible and the fuels can support wildfire close to communities. And the types of scenarios we're thinking of, we're not thinking of these catastrophic wildfires that are going to be beyond what the BC Wildfire Service and what the fire departments can handle. And, and, and catastrophic wildfires, things like Kelowna in 2003 or Lytton, that's very, very unlikely in Juan de Fuca. What's much more likely are really small fires in people's backyards, really close to homes. And I really want to make sure that the risk of these fires is not discounted. In some ways, these are just as concerning especially in a community like Juan de Fuca, where it's very, very forested. This is pretty atypical for us, or communities like this are quite atypical in British Columbia, where there is a very, um, the, the, the boundaries between developed communities and forests are basically non-existent here. This is a community, these are communities embedded in the forest. And so a small fire of a hectare or two hectares can be quite concerning because there's just homes and fuel are basically continuous. The second point is that we're also in a part of the world where most of the land in the wildland urban interface is privately owned. And that makes it hard for us to get a really accurate picture of the complete wildfire risk environment. However, because our community is embedded in the forest, the difference between forested and like forested crown land and private forested land isn't that significant. So even those gray areas that I was showing you on the map, those likely are moderate wildfire risk too. And the risk profile is likely the same. And it's perhaps even higher because private land is where most of those values are located and where 
things are most vulnerable to wildfire. So I know that was a very short presentation, probably a lot of technical information, but I'm happy to, to turn it over and answer any questions that might have come up throughout that. There are currently no questions in the question and answer forum. Um, but if any come up along the way, we can probably, there's probably time at the end of all the presentations to answer more questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Car Connor. Uh, and Connor is not leaving us. If you have any questions about how he arrived at, at uh, the judgments that are in the Community Wildfire Resiliency Plan or what that means for you and in your area, uh, please do put those in the Q&A box and we'll make sure that they're answered before we get out of here. Uh, next speaker will be, I believe, uh, Rob Severson from CD Smart, Fire Smart. And he'll be talking about how to protect your home during a wildfire. Excellent, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, let me just see if I can get this up here. There we go. Um, can you hear me good? You're fine? Perfect. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, okay, so what Connor was mentioning there about how our homes are built um, right into that wildland urban interface uh, is really interesting, and that's very, very common in the Wanda Fuca area. Uh, I know we're building houses there because everybody loves nature, so um, it's nice to be close to it, but there are some concerns as far as fire smart goes with uh, all that fuel pressed right up against our homes. Uh, the picture you're seeing right now uh, is a really good one. This was after, uh, I think this was out of Clinton and uh, probably 2017 or 2018 and I was up there, but um, you can see where some houses did burn and some didn't. And uh, I think a lot of that goes down to what mitigation was done prior to the fire going through. And that's where the fire smart program um, really gets into play. So Rob, what is can I inter oh, sorry. interrupt you? Yeah. I can't yeah. see any picture. Uh, oh, should one be up there? There should be. I'm seeing it. Stand by. No problem. So you're not seeing that? No, not yet. Okay. Uh, you can try and share your screen there. We're seeing you. Oh, no, that's not what I want to see. <laughs> Let's see. You look great. I oh, like yeah, thanks. Uh, do you see that? Yeah. Yeah, closer. And then I think oh, if you could cool. start the slide, there you go. You see that now? Perfect, nice work. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so back, this this is a photo that I was uh, referring to rather than just myself. Uh, you'll see here this one where, um, where the houses, some did burn and some didn't. And so FireSmart is really uh, based on mitigation and a lot of stuff that you can do yourself as homeowners. Uh, and it's really important to be prepared if, you know, this image, hopefully you can see that, um, was to come our way. Uh, the idea is that the embers from that fire don't have a place to land by your home and ignite. So that's what Fire Smart is really getting into. Um, and here it is, what is Fire Smart? And I'm hoping that there are people out there that do know what it is. And if you don't, I would recommend going to the uh, FireSmart website. Uh, FireSmart BC has done a great job, uh, but it really comes down to homeowners doing a little bit of mitigation work around their home and building resiliency. And it's proven that it will work if there is, a, is an ember shower coming your way. So why should I care? Well, everybody should care. And this is my favorite part about this is um, the best protection is prevention. So the Fire Smart program is all about that. Um, the Capital Regional District has a really great rebate program if people are interested in this. So if you're doing work around your homes, um, there may be a way to get you some money back up to $500. So that's something that you can uh, talk to some of your local Fire Smart representatives. Every, every fire hall right now has an LFR in it in the one Fuca area. So they will be able to help you with any of those questions, or you can direct everything to myself at the end. There'll be an email that we'll put up. Uh, here it is, structural survival statistics. So I'm not gonna bore you with too many stats. However, if you are doing no treatment and you have a cedar shake roof, 
this shows 4% survival rate of your, this is your home. And uh, if you are doing mitigation work and you've got a metal roof or um, asphalt shingles, you're up to 90%. So it does work. It's a very effective program. And that's why the province and the CRD are really, we're really trying to push it and get the word out there. Okay, I've got a quick little video to show. Um, hopefully this works. Jonathan, let me know if you don't hear any, any sound. Uh, it sounds like it's muffled, maybe coming through your speakers. Can you go and make sure that uh, yeah. that share audio setting is on? It was earlier, so why isn't it now? That's what happens when you try and have firefighters. Uh, <laughs> wow, I know, and I'm way out in the middle of nowhere here. So hang on here now. Uh, <laughs> let's see. I'll try this again, team. Not sure why it worked earlier and not now, but yeah, I'm not even seeing it. Okay, well, we'll disregard that little video. No problem. Uh, we do have some time if you want. I think it's under if you share your screen and then there was in that bottom left corner, right? Share audio. Yeah, yeah it was there, but it's not giving it to me now. It's not there for now. No. Okay. Oh, feel free to move on. Okay. Yeah. And so um, anyway, just to let everybody know that they're uh, in your area, there is an active fire smart program. So if you're, I know there's some people uh, in from Shirley or um, we were out doing assessments there and uh, Otter Point, it's, we, we're doing them in Otter Point as well. And Port Renfrew, East Soup. So all you have to do again is either get a hold of email myself or it should be, uh, as far as I know, on every fire hall uh, web, web page, there's a link to the FireSmart program. And that will go to a local FireSmart representative and somebody will be able to come out and give you a free home assessment. Uh, and it, none of it is shared. And that comes up a lot. People ask the questions, uh, who gets to see the assessment? Nobody. It's just recommendations that are made to you and um, ways that you can build some resiliency, resiliency into your home. And again, as I mentioned, there is a rebate program. We can get you up to $500 back possibly. So um, that's part of it as well. So please let me know if you have any questions. And we will try and figure out this little video for next time. No problem. Uh, maybe uh, where could people go if they wanted to see a video like that? I got everything from the BC FireSmart webpage. And uh, it's there, there's a lot of information on there. And I would recommend anybody go and just start to look at it if you're if you're at all interested. Uh, which I hope people are, because there's a lot of value to it. And then, um, you know, like I said, get a hold of a local fire smart representative in your area, and we can go from there. Excellent. Do we have any questions, Gillette? Um, let me get to my Zoom screen, because I was just trying to find a, a link to post. Uh, for the FireSmart page, but no, okay. there are currently no questions, but I will put a link for the FireSmart page into the chat in a moment. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, if, if you folks are interested at all in having someone have a look at your home or even better, uh, have someone pay you $500 uh, to help protect your home, uh, please do uh, dive into the, the FireSmart website or, or our website at the CRD because there's lots of good information there. Uh, and yeah, they, they, those programs are there and a lot of people don't know about them. So next, uh, we have Jane from CRD Protective Services and she'll be speaking to us on evacuations. Thanks, Jonathan. I am just sharing my slide now. Okay, so I hope I'm showing my uh, evacuation primer slide. We've so I'm, I'm just gonna be talking to you about the basics of evacuation. So in this section, I'm gonna cover an overview of evacuation behavior. Um, I'm doing this uh, 
just to review the language and process of evacuation and talk about preparing for evacuation. I'd like to give you some context as I talk about how people behave during evacuations. I personally have been evacuated twice. I was on Haida Gwaii during the 2012 and 2013 earthquakes and tsunami evacuations. And neither time did I immediately evacuate and neither did many of the people that I know. I think before those events, I would have assumed that warning the public would be a simply a matter of informing them that they were in danger and waiting for them to take the appropriate action. You sound the alarm, people get the message, they evacuate. In fact, people do a variety of things. They argue with their spouse, they go online and do some research, they go back to sleep, or what I like to do, call my mother. This causes delays in action, but it also means some people never evacuate at all. Now this turns out it's not unusual. People are complicated and the way we make decisions is complicated. And some very smart people have studied why this happens. Now this is Lyndall and Perry's model outlining the decision-making process. And the shorthand is this, for a person to evacuate or take any protective action, they need to get the message that they're at risk, feel that they're in danger. So that's feel it, like actually feel scared and understand what they're supposed to do. Research has also shown that there are, things, there are things that we can do to communicate evacuation information in a way that is more helpful. First, we can make sure the message is coming from a trusted source and demonstrate that the messenger can be trusted. We can provide clear messages and ensure that messaging is consistent across different media. So you're getting the same message on the radio that you're getting through a tweet. Um, we can also have two-way communication before an event occurs, which is what we're trying to do right now. So I'm going to talk about evacuation language because being clear and precise about the language we use can make making those decisions easier. So an evacuation alert means that an evacuation is possible, be ready. An evacuation order means you are at risk, leave the area immediately. A resend means it's safe now, you can go back home. Shelter in place means stay where you are, wait for the authorities to give you instructions. Another couple terms you'll hear are reception center and assembly area. A reception center is a hub where volunteers provide, provide assistance to evacuees and an assembly area is a designated safe location to park or wait while waiting for more information. So the two final terms I wanna cover, a soul, a state of local emergency. A soul is a legal term. It's a process by which a local authority like the CRD is allowed to use extraordinary emergency powers such as requiring an evacuation. A tactical evacuation is done because there isn't time to do a soul and the responders on the scene have to evacuate immediately. So, on pro so the process on paper looks like what I'm showing right here. Uh, the hazard occurs and the evacuation alert is issued so the public knows that they should prepare. The hazard escalates and a soul is issued and then quickly followed by an evacuation order. The area is evacuated, the situation improves and the order is rescinded and everyone returns home. However, this is also what happens. There's an event that happens, there's a tactical evacuation and all of the paperwork is done afterwards. So where will you receive this evacuation information? Ideally, you're gonna be bombarded with it. It's gonna go out on the CRD notification system. It's gonna go on social media, news sources, and likely the provincial uh, intrusive system will, will um, let you know as well. There's also going to be responders going door to door and traffic signs and flaggers. If you haven't already signed up for the CRD notifications, please do so. We're gonna put the uh, information in the chat because it will also provide you with other warning information. So what, so what are we doing and what can you do to prepare? Well, the CRD has created evacuation guides specific to the electoral areas. The guide is short and sweet. It has a map of each area with possible reception centers and assembly areas. It has contact information for the area's emergency program and where to sign up for area specific emergency alerts. It covers knowing the risks, um, and the basics of understanding uh, evacuation messaging, same as I have already just given you. It will have a, it has a fillable um, household emergency plan and a checklist that you can use as you're going out the door and if, should you need to evacuate. Um, 
in the JDF, we have them for Shirley, Port Renfrew, and Jordan River. And then we have another guide that's Otter Point, East Souk, and Souk. The guides are available in hard copy from your local emergency program. That's Jerry, who you're going to be hearing from shortly, or in digital version at the link that we're going to be adding to the chat. So a final comment on preparedness, the province has supplied an online evacuation assistance tool and CRD volunteers are training on it. So if you can't make it to a reception center and need help, we're still going to be able to help you. If you want to be proactive and get ahead of the game, make sure you have the BC services card app on your devices. It makes using the era tool easier and you can pre register if you need to. The app is free on the Apple App Store and Google Play. Okay, well, thanks for taking the time to listen to me. Hopefully you never have to evacuate, but if you do, you're going to have the right information to make the decisions you need to protect yourself and your family. So I'm, I'm here if there are any questions. There's currently no questions, Jane. There's one question. It's about FireSmart, so we can come back to that at the end of the uh, program. Thank you, Gillette, and thank you, Jane. So the very last uh, presentation today, and we will open the whole panel up, as we said at the end, uh, but will be Jerry Grant to speak on wildfire preparedness. Thank you, Jonathan. If Jane can uh, stop sharing the screen, that'd be great. <laughs> All right. So um, thank you, Jane, for talking about evacuations. And that really is a great segue in for me to talk about a grab and go bag, because a grab and go bag is like a small emergency kit that you use when you have to grab and go. And I have my personal grab and go bag here right now. And just going to give you an idea of the kinds of things that are in there. Uh, one of the things that uh, everybody has is usually a flashlight. I actually prefer to use a headlamp. and the reason I like to use a headlamp when it's hands-free, I also make sure that I have a charging cable. You'll notice, you will notice that I use a lot of um, Ziploc bags, but I like to have a car charging uh, piece in it. Also a wall ward as I call them in there as well so that I can charge it wherever I happen to be. Uh, another thing that's really important, and I'll just pull it out of my brown bag, it's having your important documents with you. So I have photocopies of my marriage certificate. I have my insurance. But the other thing I have is I put everything on a zip drive, like so. So on this zip drive, it's not just some of these documents. I have my passport. I have my birth certificate. I have photographs uh, from family members, old photographs that might get lost, you know, if I were to pass away or the house burnt down. I have managed to uh, scan as well art projects for my kids from the time they were in kindergarten all the way through elementary school that means so much to me i even have a few letters from my um my late father that mean a, a heck of a lot to me so having those things really gives me uh comfort they are on an encrypted uh, zip drives uh, so nobody else can get my personal information other items that uh, should be in there and i really like these are uh, power power uh, battery uh, storing devices, lack of better words. And I have two of these. I have one that I always keep in my grab and go bag. I have an identical one beside my computer. Once a month, I recharge it. I put it into my grab and go bag. I take the other one out and have it by my computer. So I'm constantly rotating those. A whistle is a great thing to have with you. People know where you are. These little emergency um, blankets, uh, you don't have to go to an emergency supply store and buy these where they charge you an arm and a leg. You can get these at the dollar store, very inexpensive. Let's talk about maybe doing some personalization of your, of your kit. I happen to have asthma, so I need to make sure that I have my medication with me. One of the things that I do, and I just recently renewed my prescriptions, is again, that's when I change them out. I write, the month and the year on there. So I'm always, always rotating those. And as well, because I have asthma, if I'm leaving this time of the year because there's a fire, I, I do have a mask, an N95 mask. And most of us have them nowadays after uh, COVID. Should you be so 
unfortunate that you have to evacuate your house and you have to stay at a reception center first go to reception center and then stay in group lodging one of the things i really recommend and it's not usually on the list when you go and look up the list is a set of earplugs because you're now going into a place where you're going to have quite a few people uh everybody's got different sleeping habits some people snore some people don't you know they're walking they're doing things they're talking you're going to need that um a sleep mask usually in group lodging there will be emergency lighting and for some people it's very difficult to fall asleep with that so having a sleep mask to block out the noise the other thing i like as well is sometimes is having one of these microfiber face cloths you can get them wet and put them again over your eyes but as well you can use them just for basic hygiene other items that i take with me in my emergency kit I actually take um, a few fun items. I have a deck of cards and I have a couple of uh, travel games. Boredom will be something that will set in. And if you're bored, you might end up having to be working in the reception or group lodging. They'll put you to good use. But, you know, having a, a deck of cards, you're going to all of a sudden become incredibly popular. First aid kit, a small first aid kit. And again, I customize this. I have my allergy pills and a couple of other things that I may need that somebody else may not. Well, let's see what else is in here. It's summer. And so because it's summer, I have put in here my summer weight pajamas. And again, clearly I'm worried about people's noise. So I have another pair of earplugs. I always keep spare underwear and, and a t-shirt, so I've got something to change into uh, the next day if I'm displaced. Comfort items. Now, we always want to make sure that we have food, and I do have food. Um, lots of people use granola bars. I actually spend the extra money and buy these bars that are good for five years. These ones, I uh, was one of these people uh, this year, I bought a whole bunch of these for people for uh, stocking stuffers so make sure I have a few for myself but one of my comfort items is I like to have uh you know uh, a cup of soup so I have a miso soup that I have in here in a couple of spoons may not be everybody's cup of tea and when we talk about tea I also carry with me my own mug that I'm responsible for and I make sure that I have a variety of teas and coffees that I've got in there things that I like so I'm not going to be irritable around everyone else. Another item you should have in your grab and go bag is a crank radio or battery operated. Now I do have batteries in here, the rechargeables, but it is crank operated as well. And it's a great item to have. I'd show you my money that's in there. I usually have a little Ziploc bag full of money, but I've taken that out because I needed some small bills the other day. I should be putting it back and this is my reminder to do so. Um, every grab and go bag, you really need to customize for yourself. You know, you have to put in things, um, things like I have a, a book, but because I have a book in here to read, I also have an extra pair of reading glasses, uh, that sort of thing. If you have children, you've got to make, uh, grab and go bags that are customized for your child. And you've got to remember to sit put some things in there that's actually going to comfort them. If that's a little toy, a stuffed animal, maybe it is a package of Twizzlers, but you're putting something in there to try and, and give them a little bit of comfort. You need to have a different grab and go bag should you have elderly parents with you. A lot of different medications that you might need to put in there. Do you have pets? You need a bag for your pets as well. And that includes having a, you know, a leash and a couple of other things. We've got great resources at the CRD. There's a, we have a website, prepareyourself.ca. If you go on that website, you will find all sorts of tips for putting together all sorts of kits. We also have some on our YouTube channel. I would say, check it out. They're not very long. There's one for your emergency kit, grab and go bag, and then all the other considerations, seniors, children's pets, also your car. I didn't mention about having water in my bag. My bag, if I, once I start putting stuff back in, it's pretty heavy. I don't put water in my kit because I have another kit in my car. And in my car, I do have water. I don't put, I don't have water 
that's in plastic bottles in the car because especially in the summer, the plastic can absorb gasoline. So I actually have the foil, um, I spend a little money there. I buy the foil packages of water, but I always make sure that I have it with me. Um, a whistle is a good thing to have. The other thing I would say, because again, we're talking about evacuations during wildfire season, never let your gas tank get below half. If the community has to evacuate or even just a small section has to evacuate, it takes time. And right now, as we all know, out in the Juan de Fuca and Souk area, they're paving. You add people trying to leave along with all the road construction right now, if you're on a quarter of a tank or less, you may run out of gas. So really, really remind yourselves to keep your gas tank half full. The other one is to park. When you're parking your car during fire season, park facing out. You just have to go straight out. Um, other than that, as I said, we have really great resources on the prepareyourself.ca site. I invite you all to take a look and uh, any questions. I certainly couldn't show you everything in my bag, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Uh, Jerry, there are currently no questions for you. We're very thorough. That's probably why. <laughs> As usual. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't thank even you very show much, you. Jerry. I didn't even show you my the, the socks and the work gloves and like there is <laughs> the other thing what one other thing I would say the very bottom of my uh grab and go bag is I have a towel and it's carefully put there if you have to be in group lodging you know the, you want to have your own towel even if you're just washing up in the bathroom of some place those are the sorts of things that are going to make it easier um having stayed in group lodging overnight one night it taught me a lot of things as to what I'd really want to have with me. <laughs> no, sounds good. very good. Uh, I think we have drawn on some experience, including yourself, of sometimes people who have actually been evacuated. Uh, it's uh, often something we try not to think about it, but a little bit of forethought can go a long way in terms of your own comfort, uh, if in fact that does happen here. And I did, I forgot to mention one other thing about toiletries. I've got so many items here right now, but one of the things that I do, I'm sorry, one of the things I do besides having, you know, the toothbrush and that, I go and ask for samples at the at counters, um, and that could be sunscreen samples uh, at the cosmetic uh, counters. I will ask for every kind of sample. Yes, and I have a bag full, so, and it takes up less room. There you go. So thank you very much. Be assertive. Ask for samples. <laughs> if there's an inundation of, of folks in Souk um, <laughs> asking for samples tomorrow, we know why. All right. Uh, well, let's open this up for just questions to anybody in the panel, anybody you've heard today, uh, or any questions you have generally about wildfire and how this, this is going to work in your area, how you can be prepared. Uh, Jolette, you, you mentioned that there was a question in the chat, eh? Yeah, there is one question for Rob. Um, he says, I have an assessment scheduled and I'm hoping to do some work, but I want to make sure I do things in the right order. With regards to the rebate program, are the applications with the FireSmart representative or are they online? Uh, that's great. So the, the province, uh, they are, UBCM is very sticky about this. So you want to do your assessment first. And then what you need to do is after that, as long as the work you're doing was recommended by the local fire smart representative, then you will be eligible for some of the rebate or all of it. And then you need to call for a reassessment. So it's typically the same local fire smart representative that came out first will come back again. And once they do the second assessment, we'll put the paperwork and send it in. So the paperwork doesn't happen until after everything is complete. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So we need okay. to do one assessment, then then the work, then a reassessment, and then the paperwork <laughs> is filled out and sent in. Thanks, Rob. I see another question here in the gallery. Um, she asks, is there a way that signs can be put up at the entrance to public beaches, letting people know that they cannot have campfires on the beach? We've had to put out many campfires every year on the beach by Muir Creek. Uh, 
John. I'm probably about as good as any yeah. to speak to that. Um, so I can't speak to your specific location in uh, Muir Creek. I assume you're in most likely the Shirley Farder uh, protection zone. Um, that's, that's my guess anyways. Uh, what I wonder is who owns that land and can we work with them to put on uh, a sign? Uh, I, my guess is most landowners would be interested in that if it's a CRD park, even better. Uh, and, and if that's the case, actually send me a note and then I can bring that over to our parks department. <laughs> Land is for sure. I see this in the chat there, Karen. Um, generally, so that there is an owner, even if it's a, the province sometimes, up until the low, low water mark. Uh, and so whoever owns that land is the one we'll need to talk to or about uh, in terms of ownership and, and what signage makes sense there. But I think there's a larger point that I could speak to where we want to make sure that people know the rules. And you're always going to get a, a certain percentage of people that um, either don't know the rules or they know the rules and they don't particularly care. Uh, and they're going to be lighting fires and using fire where there's not much we can do that about about that, uh, at least in terms of signage, it's mostly an enforcement problem. Uh, but uh, for those folks who do want to follow the law, which is most of us, I think signage is a big deal. So that when people know where they can and can't use fire. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, most of the individual fire departments in each community have addressed in a number of ways. They have, a, you know, with their websites and their signage that they do it try and keep updated. But uh, in terms of trails, I think that's a, a good point. If you'd like to follow up with me, uh, you can send a little note to uh, protective services at crd.bc.ca. You don't have to write that down. That is the address uh, that you would have seen. If you got th to this far to the webinar, uh, you, you can find that address in the description. Send me a note about where you want to to follow up with, uh, and then I can dig into that. Perhaps it might be a, a CRD park and um, that'll make it a little bit easier for us. Hopefully that answered your question. Uh, I'm okay. again going to give it just a beat here uh, before we move on okay. for final questions. There was a question that came in the email, in the Protective Services email a few days ago, Jonathan. Do you remember that one or do you want me to read it out? It was about... Um, property line and fire protection near somebody's property line. Do you remember that one? I think you might have be, be referring to one in <clears throat> Salt Spring Island. Yes. Oh, right. That's right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the idea there is that some parts of different communities are covered by a fire protection, uh, fire department, and some places are not. So some places are, some places are not. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that makes a difference. Uh, of course, BC Wildfire Service um, responds to all areas and, and is available. So it's not like you're, that you're stranded, but um, if you have a, a local fire department, you know, and you value that local fire department and hopefully you can go help them out and volunteer because they're doing the Lord's work out there uh, and they're doing it a very high quality. So uh, really impressed with our fire departments uh, and um, most of you have fire protection locally in your communities. Any other last questions? There's nothing in the question and answer box at this time. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we'll give you your time back. Uh, just before you leave here, I'm going to do one last poll. So please just stay with me for this one last poll. I promise it'll be worth it. Uh, we want to know two things from you. First, uh, do you feel more prepared for wildfire in the community than you were at the beginning of this session? We wanna make sure we're using your time well. And then the second part of that, is there something you heard today that you can take an action on? Is there something you can do to your house in your, in your community uh, with your family perhaps to prepare for evacuations? Just let us know, you can be honest. Well, I think we have most people participating. I'm just going to share the results here. Uh, I think people generally feel more prepared. Uh, some people are somewhat more prepared. I think we have some pretty a pretty educated crowd that tends to come to these, so that's um, perhaps not surprising. And then number two, there uh, almost everybody heard something today that they can take an action from, and that's really good for us to hear. So uh, 
thank you very much for attending. Uh, and that is the next step here. Uh, we want to thank all of our, our speakers today, all of our presenters, and then to you as well for attending. A link to this session will be in your inbox within a week. And the intention here is to put this up onto uh, some sort of video streaming platform, most likely YouTube, so that folks who were not able to attend today can uh, see the, the content that we shared. But wait, there is more. So this session is actually, uh, it's kind of exciting that we're launching a number of products, a lot of plans. So we heard today about the Community Wildfire Resiliency Plan. You can go online and read all 100 plus pages of it. It's really well done, a lot of detail there. If you are not willing to dive into 100 pages, we uh, created an at-a-glance summary that's only three pages and has most of the information that you're probably looking for. It is online on this website. There's also the household evacuation guides you heard about. And please, please, if you are not signed up to the public alert notification system, uh, it's going to make it that much more difficult for us to get emergency information to you in a timely manner. Uh, and that's all we're ever going to use it for is emergency information. So do sign up for that. All of that can be found at the link that you see there. Uh, or even simpler, just search for JDF emergency, type that into your search bar. Uh, it should be your first result. Thank you much for atten attending the webinar. Uh, and we hope you learned something that you can use. Goodbye. <laughs>